Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining us in your respective time zones. Uh, let me first wish you all a very happy International Women's Day. To celebrate this special occasion, we have decided to host our event one day early to free up calendars for multiple events happening tomorrow. I hope uh, that makes sense for everyone. And please let us know in the comment box so we can take note for next year's event. Um, also, throughout the event, please use uh, the comment section for your questions, uh, noting which panelist the question is for, and we will try and address all your uh, questions in the Q&A session. For those of you who don't know me, I am Nishan Pandey, uh, the CEO of the American India Foundation. Uh, AIF works with the government, uh, private sector, civil society, and other actors to eradicate multidimensional poverty in India through high impact interventions in education, health, livelihoods, leadership development, and emergency relief. Through these programs, we have served uh, close to 17 million of India's underprivileged across 35 states and un union territories. Uh, AIF's mission and program are designed and implemented uh, through the lens of gender equity and the empowerment of women and girls to drive sustainable change at the family, community, and societal levels. Our programs empower women to embrace dignified livelihoods, become entrepreneurs, attain financial literacy, embrace menstrual equity, stay healthy through pregnancy and motherhood while raising uh, thriving children, make educated decisions about their future, uh, bridge the gender divide and STEM careers, increase female workforce participation, and much more. To give you a sense of how this principle underscores all our work, here is a brief video. Since 2001, AIF has worked tirelessly to address multidimensional poverty through our work in public health, education, and livelihoods, while maintaining a keen focus on gender equity and the empowerment of girls and women to drive sustainable impact. In health, using a life stage approach, we ensure that pregnant women in remote rural and tribal areas have high quality health care through AIF trained ASHAs, accredited social health activists, so that their babies have a healthy start to life. To date, Mansi, our maternal and newborn survival initiative, has served over 600,000 pregnant women and newborns. Expanding the continuum of care, Mansi conducts sexual and reproductive health programs, focuses on anemia prevention, provides nutritional counseling, and champions menstrual equity to inform, educate, and empower adolescent girls to keep themselves and their families healthy. In education, AIF nurtures young girls to become curious and thriving learners. Whether it is LAMP, our learning and migration program that keeps migrant children in school, or DE, our digital equalizer program that integrates STEM pedagogy into 10,000 government school classrooms, we are working to ensure that girls stay in school to learn and aim for careers once thought to be out of reach. We have served over 4 million young girls through LAMP and DE. In livelihoods, AIF leverages technology to provide market-aligned knowledge and in-demand skills to equip young women for in-person and remote work opportunities so they can secure jobs in the traditional and green energy sectors. We also support and train women in rural and peri-urban areas to manage micro-enterprises by gaining access to loans and market linkages. AIF has enabled over 430,000 women to secure dignified livelihoods and lead financially independent lives. AIF's commitment to empowering girls and women in health, education and livelihoods remains the defining pillar of our mission and work. We welcome you to join us on this journey to transform the lives of millions of girls and women to create sustainable social change. Before we begin this program, I am happy to share an update that is very timely with the occasion of International Women's Day. 
the US State Department has selected AIF as their anchor partner for what's called the US India Alliance on Women's Economic Empowerment for the women's entrepreneurship uh, pillar. I cannot tell you how excited we are at AIF and how it affirms our impact, credibility and reputation as an international development organization working to empower women uh, to be chosen from you know, numerous applicants for this prestigious role. It gives us a platform to convene diverse stakeholders around this issue and create impact at scale uh, in this area of strategic priority for AIF. So today I am absolutely thrilled uh, to be moderating a stellar uh, panel uh, uh, with three powerhouse philanthropic leaders. So let's just dive in. Uh, without further ado, let me uh, introduce them. Please welcome uh, Maya Patel, uh, CEO of the Tarsadia Foundation, uh, Pia Desai, uh, Executive uh, Director of Samvit Ventures and Director uh, of DS Advisors, and Rohini Lenekani, uh, Chairperson of Rohini Lenekani Philanthropies and Co-Founder and Director of uh, Xstep. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Pia. And thank you, Rohini, uh, for lending your time and knowledge today from three different time zones. Maya uh, obviously is based in uh, West Coast, Pia from the East Coast in the US, and Rohini from India. Um, each of your uh, philanthropic entities has uh, you know, such a rich history and wide scope. And for those uh, who aren't familiar, could you please uh, give each uh, you know, qu quick introduction about your organization? Uh, Pia, would you like to go first? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nishan. Um, so Some Adventures is a philanthropic family foundation focused on improving lives of underserved individuals through education, entrepreneurship, and health and wellness. Um, we, where possible, we think about applying technology and innovation and are committed to building more inclusive economies. We're sort of unusual in our structure, so we're structured as an operating foundation, which means that we actually run our own programs much of the time, and then sometimes we run programs um, in partnership with other organizations um, who are highly aligned, like AIF. Um, our work is focused in the U.S. and in India, um, and I'm thrilled to be here. On a personal note, like Nishan said, I'm based on the East Coast in New York. Um, I have three beautiful young children and in my spare time like to practice yoga and love to read. Fantastic. Thank you, Pia. Uh, Roni, uh, please tell us about your organization. Yeah. Namaste, everyone. Um, I have been in the what I call the Samaj sector for more than uh, 30, 35 years now. And I've been a serial social entrepreneur starting several organizations which has culminated now in two or three main ones, which is Rohini Nilekini Philanthropies, where I do the bulk of my philanthropy, Extra Foundation, where my husband Nandan and I, along with many other talented people, have tried to create an open source platform to work on education and then many other things. And um, we are also part of something together called societal thinking, where we are looking at how do you solve problems at scale and with some sense of urgency. What is the framework to do that effectively? So that's the societal thinking team. But in my philanthropy, I support several issues, environment and climate, gender, which we'll talk about, I think, a little later, access to justice, independent media, arts and culture, and so on. So this is my day job. I've been doing it for decades and hope to continue doing exactly that. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much, Roni. Such a comprehensive landscape of uh, work that you guys do. Um, such a pleasure to have you. Maya, uh, would you please share a bit about the Sadia Foundation? Sure. Thank you, Nishant, for having us here today. Um, the Tersadia Foundation was founded by my parents in uh, 2009. Uh, they grew up in a small village in Gujarat and, you know, they wanted a better life. And so they relocated our family to Zambia. And we, you know, they did very well there. And eventually we moved to the United States and we've been in California for over 50 years. We never moved once we got here and very happy to be here. Um, for the past decade, we've been working hard trying to break cycles of poverty and unleash human potential. From the very beginning, 
our family believed in the power of service and partnership. Um, today, our foundation impacts reaches across multiple continents and across many areas of impact. Um, our work has really helped us um, work across the globe. We have a network of 100 partners who are fueling inclusive mobility, tackling current crisis and future threats, inspiring human transformation. Um, it's been a wonderful journey. We're so committed to rebuilding India's social and economic systems so that marginalized communities across the country can reach their full potential. Our portfolio of partners reflect our family of compassion, of values and of compassion and service. Um, it's been some a beautiful journey, not just for ourselves, um, but our, for our extended family as well. We've included our next gen in this and um, the work that we've done has really impacted their lives and we see that ripple effect happening um, and them taking in some action on themselves. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Maya. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, the work you all are doing is so inspiring. And as an implementation partner of your organizations, we at AIF, thank you and applaud you. Um, you know, our theme today is catalyzing social and economic empowerment. And uh, my team and I were just discussing uh, this morning how empowerment is the right descriptive word for much of our collective work. But it has also become so overused uh, that the definition has kind of gotten lost. So I want to start by asking uh, all of you, uh, what does empowerment mean to, to you? And what is the most uh, you know, powerful, let's say, data point around gender equity that has you know, motivated you and inspired you as a leader to shape your strategy for impact in this space? Uh, you know, looking at the challenges alone can be daunting. So I want you to also focus on how you have leveraged the challenge into opportunities for your organizations and the communities that you intend to serve. So maybe we can start with uh, with Rohini. Yeah, thank you, Nishant. Uh, and by the way, it's great to be here. We can't see the audience, which I always hate. But <laughs> to the whole audience, whoever is watching, namaste and waving our hands. But um, yeah, so empowerment, what does it mean? So empowerment should mean the same thing when we're talking about empowering others as it should mean when we think of our own empowerment. And what do we all want when we speak of our own empowerment? I think we have distilled it to three simple words, agency, choice, and dignity. And I think if I have the agency to act on my own behalf, if there is some freedom of choice when I make some decisions, and if I can do all those things with, some, with my dignity in, intact, uh, no matter how poor or rich I am, no matter what I, area I work in, then I think there's more likelihood of me feeling empowered and also then be on a mission to empower others. So I would use those three simple words, agency, choice, and dignity. Um, did you want me to talk about the gender work now or later, Nisha? Uh, we, we'll, come, we'll come to that, uh, Roni, in a minute. Uh, right. Maya, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, to me, empowerment is really, again, same thing about personal agency. I think that's, and the freedom to build a life that you dream of. Um, my perspective was shaped by my upbringing. You know, I had a very patriarchal family. We lived in that sort of world in my generation. And I was lucky to have a supportive family, though. They were open-minded and they encouraged me to believe in myself. Uh, they empowered me as a young, young, at a young age to use my voice. I didn't know how to use it then, but I think as I've gotten older, I've been able to make better decisions and to work confidently in the world. And that helped me, you know, having that support system around me. Um, one powerful data point that you were mentioning about gender equity that shaped our work at the Tirsadia Foundation is about gender pay gap. In the US, the gender pay gap hasn't changed in two decades. Women earn an average of 82% of what men earn. Uh, globally, it's 77%. At this current rate, it's estimated that it takes 257 years to close the gender pay gap, which is crazy to think about. I mean, that is just absolutely absurd. Women are just as capable as men, and there's no reason for this pay gap to exist. Um, we do a lot of work at Tirsadia to help address this issue through our inclusive mobility pillar. We support organizations that empower women to achieve economic and prosperity through financial inclusion workforce development and opportunities to access education. Um, last year, we supported over 155 female-headed households with economic opportunities across India. 
and invested in about 15,000 women entrepreneurs here in the US. That is how we're trying to make this, um, this needle change. Right. Thank you, Maya. Pia, what do you think of, uh, what, do you, what do you think when you think of empowerment? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, and and like Rohini said, thanks to all of you for being here. We can't see you, but I'm so grateful to, to have you here and to be able to celebrate um, International Women's Day with you. Um, I really like both of your answers, Rohini uh, uh, and Maya. And that I like this frame of agency, choice, and dignity. I think that's really interesting. And I, my sort of thought on empowerment, I think sits underneath all of that, um, which is around confidence. Um, and just really developing an ability to rely on oneself and one's own judgments. Um, without that, I think it would be, that sort of, I, I feel like is a foundational layer. And on top of that, then you have the ability um, to exercise agency, to you know, make choices with dignity. Um, I, I, would, I would say that's how, that's sort of where I, where I start when I think about empowerment. Hmm. Right. You know, you all have touched upon a little bit about the kind of personal kind of stuff. And I want to dig a little bit deeper, if you don't mind. Uh, of course, you're all very accomplished women, uh, but I'm sure you have faced gender based barriers in your you know, life journeys, uh, both professionally and personally. And, you know, there are a lot of people in the audience that I think will benefit and will get inspired from hearing from you how you, know, you overcame uh, that challenge. Uh, so uh, if you don't mind, uh, you know, sharing a pivotal experience that, you know, and how your surrounding ecosystem, whether it's family or place of business or, or even your work, uh, you know, philanthropic work uh, could have been informed or structured uh, to prevent kind of similar issues for others. Uh, maybe Maya, this time, let me invite you to go first. <laughs> Well, as a woman of color and an immigrant in the States, of course, there's been challenges along the way. Um, I was about eight years old when we moved here from Zambia. So just being a different ethnicity was a difficult um, upbringing, you know, and, and this was in the 70s. Um, I'd experienced gender barriers in business and society. Worst of all, my own head, you know, I think those are the things that you have to really overcome, like Priya said. As a woman, I'm also concerned that I wouldn't measure up in a man's world had to do a lot of personal work to overcome that doubt. Um, but the confidence building and laying that foundation is absolutely the most important thing. And, you know, you, you do persevere over the challenges. Over time, it becomes easier. It's, it's just still a part of the journey today for me. Um, I think I've had the strength to overcome these hurdles, but I've had a very supportive family, like I said, uh, by my side, breaking down the barriers with me. And, you know, it's about education. It's about, you know, talking about these things that are sometimes sticky subjects that nobody wants to talk about. We've done exercises in our family to even break down these barriers. And it's been very, um, you know, it's been a wonderful experience. Um, I remember being in India with my father about 10 years ago. We were at a big event and we were escorted to our seats. And they sat my dad down in the front row and sat me way in the back, which is kind of, I guess, the norm in India. And I was like, OK, this is how it's going to be done here. Um, my dad got up, came and picked, you know, got me and uh, had, had me sit in, with him in the front row. And that, I think, was a moment that he broke the barrier, you know, which is a very interesting, um, was a message to everybody around him. And through his actions, he acknowledged that I'm not the, that I am the leader of this work and I am going to be stepping into this space that, you know, I deserve that respect. And, you know, it was just something that really stuck to me and it, it really helped me gain that confidence that I had his support and he was going to be by my side. And these lessons have only helped me shape the work at the foundation. They also guide our next gen family members. 10 out of 12 of our next gen family members are women. And I want to make sure that they have the same kind of support that I had growing up and I want to empower them. So I feel like I'm in that role now and they're and to empower others through our work. So for, for me, it starts at home and it naturally progresses to the people and, and the communities around us. Right. And I know I've known your father, B.U., for a few years now, and I'm not surprised at all uh, <laughs> at what he did in that event in India. Um, Pia, uh, do you want to share some of your, uh, you know, uh, lessons from the from the journey that you have had personally? Sure. Um, and thank you for the uh, for me an example, Maya. Um, I think what I what I take away from that is like it really is it is a 
it starts with you as the individual, but it really does require support um, and, and buy-in from your entire community, your family and your community. Um, the example that came to mind, an early example that comes to mind of, of sort of a, a gender-based barrier, this is a bit odd, but I think it was around nurturing um, my interest in STEM when I was younger. I, I had a mind for math and science, um, and I had so much tremendous support from my parents, from my brother, who was also very kind of engineering STEM minded, um, but I didn't see other girls there. And as a result of that, I sort of selected out of it. Um, and you know, there was there was one competition that we had in middle school where I performed quite well. Um, and I think most people would have used that as an uh, and, and taken away from that. Wow, like I'm pretty good at this. Let's double down and invest more um, and continue to excel. And I didn't. I said I wanted to be in spaces where I saw more people who looked like myself. And it was a huge missed opportunity um, to develop a real edge and, and frankly, to build confidence, um, which I do think is so core to empowerment, um, and to make contributions in the field. Uh, so, so that is the example that comes to mind. Like I said, I, I really do think I had all the supports available from my from my family, from my community, it was just the absence of seeing people um, that role modeling um, and, and bridging gaps there that that kind of led to to my actions. I do think that there has been significant progress on this today. Um, so you know, middle school girls, you know, certainly in the U.S., I think are able to see are, are nudged in this direction. We're able to see more um, girls who look like them in those rooms and spaces, but they're still um, they're still a long ways to go. You know, Pia, thank you. Uh, you mentioned your interest in STEM. I have a follow up questions, but question on that. But before uh, before I ask you that question, let me invite Rohini to talk about, you know, the gender based barriers that she might have faced and how she keep, overcame uh, them. Rohini. So thanks. Thanks, Nishant. And, uh, you know, obviously, as a woman, you do face some social barriers because we are still living very much in patriarchal situations and in India, Definitely so. But I have to acknowledge that I've had a very privileged life. And I've chosen sectors in which there aren't that many barriers. In the sense, as a journalist, where I started my career, I think there were women and men equally respected almost. And then I got into social activism, where also it was the same case. Then I became a philanthropist, where, again, my gender didn't really come in the way. I guess I came from a family of three sisters and a strong mother. So that helped us also to assert ourselves a little more. I think that matters. And lastly, the only time where it's very hilarious, but because my spouse is a little famous, if any of you might have noticed, none then you like me. So what happens is because people automatically, you know, power so much rest with men that when they look at me, they think, Nandan, Nandan's wife, kya hona hogi? Nandini. So very often people call me Nandini. And first I used to get really upset and say, I come, why am I Nandini? Why is Nandan not Rohan? Now when people call me Nandini, I said, my name is not Nandini. But you can call me whatever you like, a rose after all. It smells just as sweet. So it's how you deal right. with that. So I, I strengthen myself in the face of a discrimination like that. I think that's what we all learn to do. You know, I'm going to break the rule a little bit. Uh, usually, uh, questions from the audience are taken uh, towards the end, and questions have already started flowing in. So I'm going to actually insert one question from uh, Nikita Ganatra, uh, because I think it relates to what we were discussing just now. Uh, she's asking, uh, and this is a question for, I think, anyone can answer. Um, what needs to change in the upbringing of the girl child that uh, develops an empowered mindset? Um, so this you is know, this gives me a good segue. And then, of course, Maya and Pia should go right after to tell you that one of the things in my philanthropy that we do is support work on young men and boys. Hmm. Because I think as one answer to Nikita's question, what needs to change in the upbringing of the boy child seems to be to me, a more relevant question, so that the boy in his own right, first of all, develops 
uh, an understanding of what a good gender balance in society would look like, including his own right not to be sort of drowning under some patriarchal idea of who he should be. And I think helping a young boy to understand the value of a sister or, or another girl in his family in a very gentle way to bring out the best human side of the young male in the house, I think has now become a very critical thing in the world because many, many families are realizing how to deal better with girl children and to prevent them from feeling like they're so inferior in any way or to make them fit into some old traditional roles. But not enough attention has been paid to how do you bring up young men and young boys. Maya, Pia? I totally agree. I think you're absolutely right. You know, I think it has to be a holistic approach. It's not just a one, you know, one-sided approach. Every angle has to be looked at and to, to have a, a healthy human being. I think that's what's missing. Yeah. And you know, I, I, uh, one thing, I, one comment on that is I, I think about whether it is the girl or a boy, I think about maybe sort of three layers. There's the child, him or herself. There's um, the family. Uh, and then there's kind of the broader community. And I think that you have to think about in each of these rings, what is that child hearing, seeing, observing, what lessons are they learning? Um, and just ensuring that in each of them, uh, you know, you as a parent, you as a, a family, an extended family member, you as, a, you know, a member of a community are are kind of keeping track and making sure that, that, that children are, um, are getting the messages they need. And each child kind of needs something different. You know, in some cases, it may be that um, a child has that kind of innate confidence uh, and and maybe also is in an environment where as a woman, as a girl, um, she's surrounded by lots of boys and just very naturally isn't even thinking about it, just very naturally is able to kind of stand up for herself, um, assert herself and and the, the, the set of needs that she may have may look different from you know, perhaps a girl who's going to, who has only sisters in the household is going to an all girls school, um, that sort of thing. So keeping that con a broader context in mind, I think is important too. Right. But also, also Nishan, eventually the real fact is children are going to learn from how parents behave. So mm -hmm. if parents and the relationship between the parents is really, uh, the, has a very great imbalance of power, then that's what the children are going to absorb, no more matter what your words are. Right. Yeah. Um, just, I want yeah. to go back. Sorry. Good. I want to go back to, uh, you know, what Pia was talking about um, earlier. You know, when general, you know, general public thinks about empowering, empowering women, you know, the end result, understandably, understandably so, um, of economic uh, you know, opportunity is is what you, is usually discussed, right? Which is, of course, very important. And AI's own livelihoods work is focused on improving female workforce participation rate in India, focused on women's economic empowerment, et cetera, et cetera. But looks like for all uh, three organizations that you represent today, um, the kind of path through that is very much education and tech kind of focused work. So, Pia, I want to kind of ask this question to you. Uh, I know that Sambit Ventures has been you know, supporting edtech work in Gujarat uh, through AIF. Uh, and so we have had the chance to discuss your theory of change at length over the last few years. But I think it will be good uh, for you to share it with our viewers today. Uh, why you think, uh, you know, is education a driving force uh, behind uh, women's empowerment? I also want to add a question that has come from uh, an audience member, uh, Pradeep Singh. Uh, he's asking, how can we leverage technology and data driven approaches to enhance the effectiveness and equity of social services and philanthropic interventions? I know there are lots of questions in it, uh, Pia, but I will let you address it. And then we can yeah. add yeah. as well. Thank you. It's it's such a great question. Um, Nishant, I'll start with your question and maybe we can get to the, the Q&A um, uh, question in time. So, uh, yeah, so we are uh, we have we started by supporting Deep, uh, sorry, Digital Equalizer, which was which was sort of featured in the video and has done tremendous work around just introducing STEM pedagogy, as they said. Um, and from there, we said, 
All right, we this is this is very helpful for cementing kind of an interest in the classroom and exposure to STEM concepts. What can we do to to really drive improvement in learning outcomes here? Um, and so what we did was move to a one-to-one -one computing model. Uh, and so through our program, Deep Shallow, what we're doing in um, in rural areas, remote areas, and poorly funded schools in Gujarat, um, we're providing them with. Uh, tablets. Each individual middle school child receives a tablet, uh, providing a lot of education and kind of hands-on training to teachers, um, you know, getting internet in the school, kind of working on the end-to-end -end infrastructure piece and support that's required um, as kind of a wraparound to ensure that we're not just handing a child a tablet and saying, go figure it out, but we're actually providing them with all of the um, other kind of support pieces that one would need in place to drive that improvement in learning outcomes across English and math um, and other subjects. Uh, and so we're in we're in early days. We, we piloted it last year, and this school year is the kind of first full year that we're running. But the kind of the, the theory behind it is that, and, and this was specifically actually focused on closing learning gaps between um, these more poorly funded schools and private schools. And already in the first year, we're starting to see tremendous improvement, which is incredible. And my belief is this comes from two things. This comes from, of course, the ability to actually perform better, have better instructional materials available, have teachers more engaged, have students then perform better. I think a lot of it is also, it's exciting to have a tablet in your hand as, as an individual, any of us when we have tablets in our hands are excited. Imagine how that, you know, middle school girl in Amreli feels when she has one and it is hers. Uh, she is not sharing it with her entire family. It is not being ripped out of her hand by her brothers and her parents. Um, I think that's a big piece of, of what drives this as well. Mm. And yeah. there, you know, I can cite a lot of data on why education is important um, and drives better outcomes for women. Uh, you know, I think there are, it's wide ranging, right? It is um, investments there can lead to improvements in workforce participation, lifetime earnings, GDP, as you think about the economy as a whole, there are also lots of things that can prevent in terms of child marriage, child mortality, child stunting, things like that. Um, I don't know that there's one specific data point that I would I would point to and cite and say, this is the reason why we do it. But the effects, and I think that's why it's so important. The effects are so wide ranging that the investment in education sort of obviates itself. Yeah, no, this is absolutely spot on. You know, I, uh, Pia, I was on the East Coast of India just a few weeks back in the state of Odisha. Um, in a district called Ganjam, uh, visiting a government school um, where we run our digital equalizer program, and uh, these are these these the school is part of a network of schools which is meant for scheduled caste scheduled tribe uh, children. Um, so we're talking about the the you know socially marginalized communities here, and what was absolutely astonishing is the confidence. And you were talking about confidence before that the girls were displaying in handling technology, uh, you know, enabled uh, pedagogical tools that uh, we have introduced in the school. And it was such a, a joy to watch them, uh, you know, uh, use the technology uh, that they have access to. Um, uh, Maya Roni, any thoughts from you on how technology um, can be leveraged, uh, data driven approaches can be leveraged as a uh, Pradeep uh, says to uh, uh, empower women. Maya, do you want to go first? Because I have a couple of things to say, but you go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I think a lot of the work that we've done in the past has really, we've seen that uh, momentum change and we've seen that these pools are very um, important to have in, in the school systems, which India lacks so many of these things. So to enhance their education with having this technology is very important, and I, in, you know, I know that AIF has done a tremendous, tremendous job in getting these things access to um, these type of tools. So that's, you know, I, I think it's a given. This has to happen, and it has to keep happening. Hmm. Yeah. So um, Nishan, um, you might know that our whole team is very immersed in using uh, technology to solve societal problems at scale. Right. One is uh, for example, say, and, and we believe in the power of technology to dem democratize access. And so we're very careful to be technology enabled, but not technology led. 
and to use those aspects of technology that increase access to agency dignity choice. And that is a very important thing for us to keep in mind when we use technology to design for scale. And I'll give you only two examples, um, though there are hundreds in our work. Uh, one was in Pratham Books when we started Pratham Books in 2004. By 2007, we had realized if you want to put a book in every child's hand, there's no way that one organization can do it when you're looking at 300 million children of India. And one of the big breakthroughs we had is how can you use a tech platform, an open source tech platform to allow every single person in this wonderful nation of storytellers to participate in creating stories for our 300 million children. And the minute we created an open tech platform, magic happened. Today, how many 15 years later, Pratham Books Press Story Weaver, Nishant, reach about 100 million reads across 350 languages with content created by the community. So for us, tech is a very important part of democratization of access to whatever sector we are working in. And the second example I'll give you in next step, which was which is the education um, work that we started in the pandemic, because our tech platform, again, open source, made for the government, happened to be ready just before the pandemic, when all schools shut down. Suddenly, there was no access to education. This platform came in so handy that literally billions of transactions, learning transactions, happened on that platform because it was designed for co-creation among all the teachers of the country, parents of the country, and students. So you must, in this digital age, learn in philanthropy, in the social sector, to use technology effectively so that you can achieve scale, speed, and sustainability. So as you can see, even though I was not born a techie like the rest of my team, I have been properly converted. <laughs> Just one thing I'll add to sort of tie together, um, Nishant, the experience you shared um, in Orisa and Rohini, what you were saying is, I think what technology allows is it, it creates a little bit of a virtuous cycle. And this comes from the confidence piece where when you get a little bit of confidence in, oh, wow, I can, I can do that. Um, you know, the, the, that virtuous cycle is, is a really important part of, of education uh, on that side. And then with technology uh, and that access that Rohini was describing, once you are interested, once you are confident, you are then have through with the sort of uh, introduction of an uh, of the technology and, and access that that opens up, you may have what earlier may have been one book that was available to you. You now have dozens or hundreds or millions, um, and and then you realize the wealth of information, and it, it can just feed on itself um, and build a really positive virtuous cycle. I think for yeah, I think we call it going from a mindset of scarcity to a mindset of abundance. And then when you do yeah. that, you realize how many resources are actually all around to tap into if you mm -hmm. design for that co-creation. Yeah. Great. Uh, so uh, Pradeep, uh, uh, I hope you've got uh, the answer to your question. Um, you know, uh, some of the things that we have talked about actually uh, next week uh, we have the csw 68 starting in new york uh, csw is commission on the status of women which is the multilateral conference that uh, happens every year and i have been invited to speak um, and the topic that i've been given is uh, a difficult one uh, which is around um, tracking and measurement of gender related spending how do you do that uh, mm -hmm. and it's a complex one mm -hmm. uh, complex because it's it's not it's easy to you know track and uh, measure um, you know input and out, uh, out output uh, indicators but how do you track you know uh, changes in the ideas and beliefs and uh, norms and stereotypes that kind of inform some of the issues that we are talking about in this conversation. So I want to actually, um, you know, uh, come to Maya. Uh, you know, we know that gender, gender justice is, is, is as much about changing mindset as it is about, you know, tangible programming like education and livelihoods training. And the Sadia Foundation has always kind of displayed a very progressive approach, in my opinion, 
to supporting the positive evolution of ideas and beliefs and behaviors and policies and practices. Um, I mean, not just on gender issues, but generally speaking, and then specifically on gender issues to kind of fundamentally foster a framework for women's uh, empowerment uh, and sustainability. So Maya, I think it will be very uh, useful um, to know what kind of guides you and your team at the, at the foundation uh, in this approach that you take in investing in these issues. Um, uh, this is a self-interested question. I'm going to borrow some something from your yeah. answer and use it next week at CSW. Uh -oh. um, OK, well, I think that there's three considerations that guide our investments at Tercedia. Uh, the first is the impact potential, you know, of the project or organization. This considers our impact pillars, um, and we also think about gender equity, diversity, and inclusion. You know, that guides us. It helps us um, make a framework for that. Secondly, we consider systems change, which includes sustainability, innovation, and scale. A good example of systems change partner we support is AIF. Their ad advocacy work is focused on improving the government's effectiveness when addressing health, education, and livelihoods across India. So addressing the root causes of these problems and their work is changing systems, structures, and policies. We realize that that's something that has to happen if you want the effects of the work to last and be a behavioral change. Um, last but not least, we're not, we look for opportunities, you know, for trust-based giving, something that's really been you know, we tried to figure out what this was. This was a new buzzword, but we actually were doing this a long time ago. And we support proximate leaders through multi-year funding. It's been it's been the best um, decision that we've ever made is to stick with a partner and see what the outcomes are gonna be and how we can support them for long-term. We believe the people closest to the problems are, the, are closest to the solutions. And in the case of gender justice, it's often women leaders that have lived experiences with the system and they need to change as well as deepen their knowledge about the community needs. So, you know, these are all things that we're thinking about. With that in mind, I'm also excited to say that, you know, we're also gonna be funding um, about 100 women-led organizations that are gonna be partnered through DUSRA um, to represent these promising and inspiring proximate leaders. We're truly changing India from the ground up. You know, there's, we have such a great platform and such a great ecosystem of, um, people like yourselves and our, all these partners that we feel like we need to uh, collaborate with them, work in tandem with them. With many of our partners, we they believe in our mission, we believe in our shared values, and this includes the funder as well as the nonprofit. So we try to bring everybody to the table, and that's been very effective. We know that long-term collective funding is the approach that works for us, and the impact is only possible because of our partnerships. So, you know, these are the things that have just kind of developed over time. It's really helped us stay in our lane and look at it from a different perspective. We saw silo you know, projects happening here or there. It just sometimes doesn't work as well. And I think coming together, discussing these things collectively, I think is, is the best thing that we could possibly do. Right. You know, you mentioned it, it will take 257 years, right? It's, it's, this work is not easy, right? And a lot of it is kind of intergenerational. Um, we have lots of questions coming in from the audiences, but I do want to give uh, a chance to Rohini and Pia to kind of weigh in on this um, subject of how do we kind of go about um, changing some of the ideas and beliefs and behaviors that kind of uh, inform some of the challenges that uh, we are trying to tackle through the gender justice work. Do you want to go ahead? Go ahead if you have a if you okay. have any. So, so so over the years, a lot of my work earlier was with financial inclusion of women, working on what are men to working with women. And I was going as I was going around the country, I realized that perhaps you are missing something very critical, and that is what is happening to young males, mm -hmm. not just in my country but in the whole world. I believe today there are almost two billion young males at risk of all kinds of risks and there is now enough data to support things like this that there is a shift happening that we all have to take very seriously as a society i mean i can give you some uh, some data if you like that you know in many countries today there are more girls enrolled in school than boys and from a women's perspective i think that's wonderful but from a men's perspective we really have to start thinking do you know in india 81 percent of all accidental deaths are those of men 
that there's more suicide by men than by women, that we don't think about it, but young males are more sexually abused, more instances than women, but we don't think of these things. There is a lot of frustration among young males, many of whom we know their first, their first desire is to have a sustainable livelihood, job, career, because their aspirations are zooming. And yet they're, edu they're often undereducated, underqualified, and cannot find the work that they need to live up to their continuous role as breadwinners. You know, we've been doing a lot of research on this. Our portfolio and this is called Liak, which means worthy. Because many young males are made to feel na layak, unworthy. And we want to know what is it that will help them feel more worthy themselves. Because it's, I believe that a person who feels worthy themselves is much more likely to support women and other genders. So a lot of our work is focused on this. And I think there is a lot of opportunity. And again, let me clarify, this doesn't mean you don't work for the empowerment of women. These are not at all. It is not all women or men. It is women and men. And I do believe that unless we address this as a root cause of what is happening to women, because many times when men are that frustrated, they are trained to take out aggression on the nearest people around them, often women. So it matters to women as well what is happening in the lives of men. So we are working, when we started, there was just one organization in India. Today we are working with 17 organizations, working with young males and also young girls together with the young males to sensitize them, to create safe spaces, to understand their own frustrations, to, to use sports, to use music, to use conversation, to use dialogic methods, to help them to talk openly about things like menstruation, reproductive health, their own sexual issues. And it's long, hard work. But if we want to see a society that is gender equal in some ways, I think we need, and even when it comes to government resources, public resources, thank God for the last 40, 50 years in India, we've had a lot of programming and public policy oriented towards women. But you know, we need now some of that to go in the right spaces to men as well. There are no so socialization programs for young males. So I just wanted all of us to think a little about what adjacencies we can create. Because we are not saying let only women be empowered, right? We are saying let every human being in, being empowered. So we cannot leave out nearly 50% of the population when we are thinking like that. So we have become more and more convinced that this work needs to spread a little more. Philanthropy needs to think along these lines and innovate a lot of programs so that young males can walk confidently in their lives and therefore also allow uh, uh, women to have their own rightful space as human beings. So how can they develop their own human potential as well? Because yeah. without my having to say everything, I think we know what happens when young males are out of jobs, when they, they are forced into breadwinner. You know, one last statistic, and I'll really stop, otherwise I can go on for too long. When we did some surveys, women were very anxious about their freedoms, that they didn't have enough freedom of choice. You can't go out at night, you can't do this, you can't do that. But young males, their first preoccupation was loneliness. Now, that is something to think about in society. Right. You know, I, I had a couple of more questions, but I'm going to keep them aside and actually prioritize questions coming from the audiences. Very interesting ones. There's one from uh, Barbara Weber, uh, which is kind of related to what you were talking about, Rohani. Uh, so he's asking, as uh, as you talk about agency and blazing new trails, what would be your wish for how philanthropy itself might yet be transformed when it comes to gender uh, you know, investments. Uh, Maya, uh, Pia, any thoughts on how the philanthropic sector itself should be transformed to address some of the issues that uh, we've been yeah. talking about? I think it's a great question. Um, I have sort of two thoughts on this. One, and I, I don't know that I would call this transformation, but certainly incremental um, uh, progress is, is would be useful. One is around measurement. Um, I think that there is it, particularly when it comes to, to sort of gender issues, and because so many of them, as you as you were just saying, Nishan, 
um, in Maya is a, a, a bit hard to measure. It's hard to measure how a mindset has changed. It's hard to measure how a, a girl's mindset or how a boy's mindset has changed and what impact that then has on the women, the girls and women in that man or boy's community. But I do think sort of trying to find solutions there to better measure the what has actually changed um, is incredibly important. And, um, and there just being a bigger prioritization on impact measurement generally in philanthropy, I think would be um, tremendous. The other piece is, this is the space, you know, if you think about the ways in which these sorts of issues can be resolved, there is the the piece of it which is around the individual, the girl or the boy. There is a piece of it which is around um, and, and that individual's values. There's a piece of it which is around the norms that they're observing around them. And then there's kind of the policy piece. Um, and what are the rules? Like what's allowed, what's not allowed? And I think philanthropy's role here is to be innovative and try new things that the government cannot try. You know, the government will put into place policies or organizations will put into place policies once it is definitively the action that must be taken. Philanthropy has, has um, an opportunity and frankly, I think the responsibility to be a bit creative, try different solutions, um, you know, and, or interventions um, and see what sticks and then see to how they can kind of scale them and, and get them to be adopted more broadly. Right, Maya, any thoughts from you? Yeah, totally. I, I agree with everything that Priya is, Priya is saying. And I, I think taking risks, philanthropy, this is a space that you can do that. You know, why are we sitting back and worrying about what's going to happen? This is where you can take those risks and, and innovate and pilot and, you know, work with the sectors that are really on the ground. They know what's happening. Talk to them, you know, get them to be on the table with you. Have conversations that are open and, you know, change your mindset into, into thinking that we are all collectively able to make this shift happen but we have to work together. We absolutely have to work together. So there's a question which uh, which relates very much to our on ground experience, whether it's our work in some of the most, uh, you know, remote geographies of India, um, migration prone geographies of India, or some of our work on promoting rural women's entrepreneurship uh, in uh, Eastern parts of India and so on. Um, the question is, how can we ensure that initiate? This is from uh, Kumar Rajneesh. He says, how can we ensure that initiatives aimed at catalyzing economic empowerment for women, particularly in the context of climate change resilience, are inclusive and effectively address the intersectionality of gender, socioeconomic status, and environmental sustainability? Uh, we obviously all know that a disproportionate impact of climate change is being borne by women. Uh, but we also know that, you know, women usually, traditionally speaking, are also repository of the traditional knowledge, uh, which was often very climate friendly. Uh, so we can also see women as potential leaders uh, in terms of climate action work. What has been some of your um, kind of observation and experience and thoughts on, on this subject? Do you want me to go on this? Yes, Roni, please. So yeah, we are looking now very closely at climate resilience in India because adaptation is going to be very key while the mitigation dialogues continue and India is going to play a big role in the reduction of energy from fossil fuels, I believe, in the next two decades. But in the meantime, we have no choice but to uh, to improve our resilience and adaptation techniques. And you rightly said that women come at the forefront of this. They, they bear the first brunt of it, especially because uh, of the feminization of agriculture in India. Small holdings are usually led by women. And so a lot of new and interesting work is going on. Some of it we are supporting. How do you help uh, women to have much better access through using their own data access to uh, debt, to loans. How do you help women to get use technology to be trained on, on, on what to plant, when to plant, what's happening with weather, etc., etc. So there are eight or 10 very interesting initiatives going on right now um, to help uh, women to diversify into things like agroforestry. All these things are going to help them to make their holdings a little more resilient to climate change and other environmental um, impacts and also to improve their incomes um, and drive up their livelihood sustainability. So there's a lot of that happening, but much more needs to be done. And 
on philanthropy, I think we are very happy that the diaspora is so interested in and has been doing so much through institutions like AIF. But please, there's so much more work to do in India, because if we can get India right, without getting India right, it's very difficult, 1.4 billion of us, uh, we have to innovate here. And right now, there is so much scope for innovation that philanthropy needs very much to bring in more capital to absorb that risk of innovation. Right. Uh, you know, I was going to ask, uh, obviously, these are complex problems um, and no one can solve these problems alone. And I wanted to uh, hear from you, uh, your thoughts on what role you think, um, you know, government and corporate sector can play in closing the gender gap uh, from your experience, personal experience, but also from your experience of uh, the work that you carry with uh, through your foundations. But I'm also going to kind of just combine it with a question from uh, Sanjay Agarwal, uh, where he is talking about the role of press and popular media in creating, you know, positive role models and in, uh, you know, in relation to the uh, discussion we were having about boys and men and the change that is required in terms of the mindset and emotional intelligence and so on. So just kind of, uh, uh, thoughts on uh, from you on what other kind of stakeholders, large stakeholders like the governments and the private sector and also press and popular media can and should uh, play in, uh, uh, you know, addressing the issues that we're talking about. I'm happy to start. I think on the, the first part of the question around uh, the government and private sector, um, I sort of alluded to this in an earlier answer, but I think it's challenging to expect that uh, the government or I don't know that it's reasonable to expect that the government or private sector is going to be the first actor. So I think that sort of the piloting, the experimentation happens elsewhere. And once something is ready to be adopted, what you can what they can do is scale something. They can scale something and and people are either um, required to or tend to listen to and follow the decisions that are made. So um, I think it, you know, I, I, part of the work in Onus is on the social sector to experiment more, put more in front of um, the private sector and the government to say, these, this is what works. These are the policies to enact. These are the types of things that you, you should think about adopting within your, um, within your sort of corporate culture or, you know, if it's something as clear as gender pay, um, those, sorts of, those sorts of things. Um, it's our responsibility to put more in front of them for them to then um, push out at scale. Um, I think that it's a really interesting question around press and popular media. In some ways, you know, there's such a proliferation now of where people are receiving um, news and also just in, in taking information. In some ways, it seems that that actually reduces the the footprint and the mind share that sort of the traditional press has had. Um, uh, and so, but because that, that space has now been filled um, and even larger in terms of the sort of total pie of time, uh, amount of time that people are spending engaging in media, I think there is um, a real challenge there around around modeling role modeling and and what people are seeing i think a lot of what you know rohini was earlier alluding to the loneliness that that men can feel um and certainly there is a lot of data and information on on teenage um, adolescent girls and how they interact with social media and some of the um some of the kind of concerning behavior uh, and mental health effects that that has um, i don't have a great solution there uh but it's i think that more attention has been put on that recently and has been put on a lot of um, sort of like new media companies. And and hopefully that sort of like the policy piece of that, as we were saying, in terms of um, what actions, corporations, and potentially the government will take, will will follow. Thank you, Pia. And with that, I think- Because we're running out of time, very right? briefly on the two questions. One is Samad, Sarkar, and Bazaar have to work together to solve any societal problem. Sarkar with policy, Bazaar with innovation and this uh, and the Samad with empathy and also social innovation. So without the three working together, our job, all of us who are interested in solving problems, is to reduce the friction between them to collaborate so that they all do the best they can do. On the media side, a lot has been happening. One of the things we found in our research was Salman Khan, beefy, beefy Salman Khan. 
has been replaced with Ayushman Khurana, somebody to look at, <coughs> the sort of the sensitive guy who's willing to understand how to be. It went from Salman Khan to Shah Rukh Khan's sensitive character roles to Ayushman Khurana and other such cutting edge yeah, uh, uh, characters. So it shows a shift in society about how men should behave. And I would also say there were some, there were some very important uh, thing, uh, TV series like Main Kuch Bhi Kar Sakti Hoon, which had a huge impact on how girls thought of what they should be able to do in their lives. And lastly, we have a podcast through my foundation called Be A Man Yaar, which I urge all of you to look at. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Roni. I think uh, that's the best punchline, Samad Sarkar and Bazaar. Which By the way, I have, a book, I have a book in that name and it's available to download for free because I want people to keep thinking about what is the role of Samaj, what is the role of Sarka, what is the correct role of Bazaar to solve the problems that all of us are going to be facing in droves. Please right. download the PDF and share it around. Unfortunately, we have run out of time now. There are lots of questions from the audiences, but I want to sincerely thank our panelists, Maya, Pia and Roni for this insightful uh, conversation and thank you all for you know, uh, joining across the country and the world, actually. Um, I hope this discussion, you know, inspires you to play your role in the empowerment of women and societies. And, you know, you do not have to be a bureaucrat or a philanthropic leader or a CEO to make a difference. Uh, at AIF, we will continue to focus on this issue throughout the year. Uh, all our uh, galas in the US this year will focus on this important theme. And I hope you will consider joining us uh, 11th of May in Boston, uh, 14th of May in New York, uh, 1st of June in San Francisco, and 9th of November in Chicago. So with that, uh, enjoy the rest of uh, Women's History Month and all the offerings for International Women's Day tomorrow. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Nishant. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much to all of you.